Thank you for that wonderful long introduction. <laughs> yes, I am from Trinidad and today I'm very proud of it. I want to start first by thanking the Board of Directors of the American Chamber of Commerce of Trinidad and Tobago. Good morning to all. I was really surprised when I was asked to make some opening remarks at this year's Women's Leadership Conference. But the more I thought about it, the more I understood why. So as you convene for this conference to learn and work on breaking bias, I really wish that it was under different circumstances. Circumstances where we are judged on our character and not on labels that are used to separate us. Labels such as our race, the color of our skin, our gender, who we love, where we are from, what job we have, what title we hold, or how much money we make. These labels used incorrectly can be harmful as they're not only used to identify us, but they are used to define us. These labels are all tied to institutional and structural systems that disenfranch disenfranchises an individual or a group of individuals from opportunities. Race and inequality, gender and inequality, sexual orientation and inequality, disability and inequality, and that's just to name a few. These labels are marginalizing as they preordain an individual's life to one of inequality, exclusion, and powerlessness. Being marginalized is not only incorrect, but it ignores the multidimensional layers of a person's identity and eviscerates their value, their worth, their very being. I go by the title justice, as you've heard, and I sit on the Supreme Court in Washington State in the United States of America. It is the state's highest court. And as you heard in 2020, upon joining this court, the highest court, I became the court's first black female justice. It's fourth immigrant born, and I am still the state's only openly gay black judge. I also became the first black LGBTQ Supreme Court justice in the United States. And I'm a person with a disability. Living my authentic life requires resilience to avoid the risks associated with the continuous psychological distress and adversities I encounter daily. Now, I was born and raised on our multicultural island, nation, Trinidad and Tobago. I was raised to stand up, stand out, and stand fast. Growing up, parents and teachers told me about my true history, and not just about white kings and queens, but rather included teachings about kings and queens who looked like me and who looked like the majority of people in the country. Vishnu, Allah, Shango, people of color. But the teachings were not just in books. Everywhere I turned, I saw people like me making great accomplishments in various fields of employment. My parents were teachers and my dad before passing was a school principal. We had prime ministers, we have presidents, government officials, judges, lawyers, police, doctors, nurses, teachers, business people, where I saw them, everywhere. So when I immigrated to the United States, for the first time, I encountered discrimination. And the question I asked myself was, how do I rise? How do I rise when this society keeps telling me that I don't matter. That because of the color of my skin and my gender, I'm not worthy or not equal to others. How do I rise when the very essence of my being is continuously attacked? How do I rise? How do I fit in when I know I was born to stand out? 
Well, even though society had a different plan in store for me, I missed the memo. The memo that said, Helen, you're black, stay back. You're a woman, lay back. You're a lesbian, step back. You're an immigrant, go back. You're a person with a disability, fade to black. Someone once said, to be the inspiration we were born to be and to become the leader we are meant to be, each of us must find our own voice. Prior to leaving Trinidad many years ago, I made a choice, a choice to take action, action in how I was going to be defined by society. I became paralyzed on my right side early in my A-level studies. I immigrated to the US for medical reasons, which curtailed and changed the trajectory of where I thought I was going and what I thought I would be studying. I was 16 years old and I had never thought of the word disability as pertaining to anyone I knew. But all of a sudden, I needed assistance from others to take care of my basic needs. My paralysis introduced me to ableism, feelings of not being included. Assumptions were made about my ability to participate with no thought as to how I may be able to participate as my mind worked just fine. People would speak at me or over me, but not to me, as if they did not want to see me. I saw disappointment in the faces of those who continuously reminded me that they saw my disability as my lost opportunity to become one of them, accomplished, independent, and educated, a whole woman. I had to make a choice, succumb to the baggage that came with the label disable or rise above it. I made a choice that I was going to not only write my story, but narrate it as well. I decided that I was going to be vocal, demanding to be heard and using my voice to address the inequities I encounter. To be visible, demanding to be seen and using myself as an example to remove fear, the fear of the unknown. And I was going to be vigilant, knowing the path that I take may not be popular at times, but I was resolved in staying the course because it is the only way to effectuate change. My three Vs, vocal, visible, vigilant. I also created three R's that have contributed to my growth and success as a woman. The first R is to have respect of self or self-respect. I learned that respect is a privilege and not a right. It must be earned and demanded, and sometimes it means standing fast, standing alone. The second R is being responsible to myself by understanding my own self-worth. By understanding my self-worth, self-esteem, self-regard, self-assurance, self-confidence, and self-respect all start with an understanding of one's self. In other words, we are responsible for how we see ourselves, which is then reflected on by society. Understanding our word is a lifelong journey that never ends. My third R is to not just know the difference between right and wrong, 
but rather to understand the difference between the two. Success is not just about being right, it is about doing right. My mother is a typical Caribbean mother. She had typical Trini mother. So one year when visiting me in the United States, I took mommy for an eye examination. I had just become a Superior Court judge. And I overheard a discussion my mother had with the optometrist. Mommy disclosed that I immigrated to the US at the age of 16 to attend university and that I recently became a judge. The doctor then asked her how she feels about how I turned out. My mother's response was insightful. She told him that she was satisfied with the way I turned out. Satisfied. He was obviously surprised by her word of the use of the word satisfied. But honestly, I was not. You see, to my parents, acquiring degrees and titles are wonderful, but expected. To them, the true accomplishments come from service to others, giving back. You see, once you find your voice, you then have a responsibility to do something with it. Speak from your own truth to empower others. So lately, there are a lot of discussions and training around dismantling systemic and structural systems of oppression, addressing bias. This dissatisfaction and a lack of confidence in private and public institutions have increased. The perception is that people don't matter to those with power and that those leaders are part of a bigger problem. Well, to be honest, we are. We in the legal community, you in the business community, we are part of the problem. Because to address the problem of racism, sexism, misogyny, homophobia, ableism, we must first acknowledge that the problem exists. Racism is real, sexism is real. Misogyny, homophobia, and ableism, these are all multidimensional problems. And any solution created cannot be one dimensional. Change comes with an acknowledgement of our individual and collective identity and experiences. The rules of engagement that are required mandates that we acknowledge each person's worth. Who we are is the color of our skin, is our gender, is where we were born, is who we love, amongst other things. So when formulating solutions, as you will throughout this conference, your advocacy needs to understand the rules of engagement. How do you interact or engage with someone like me? a black female lesbian who identifies as having a disability, carefully. As an individual deemed less worthy because of my race, gender, or sexual orientation, I don't have the privilege of being silent on issues that affect me. So even though my perspective may not be privileged based, it is still worthy of consideration. I already don't have much of a say because of the labeling. So why would you want to take that say that I have away? These marginalized identities overlap or intersect with systems of oppression and discrimination that remind me daily that I am not privileged. So in formulating solutions to advance women's rights, ask, how do you in interact or engage with someone like me, a black female lesbian who identifies as having 
a disability thoughtfully. You see, I'm standing over here wondering if you can see me. You invite me in and I'm so excited to join you and to have a seat at the table. I'm just blown away by your generous act. But when I stand to join you, you seat me, close enough to be seen, but far enough away to not be heard. And when I try to speak, you silence me, making it clear that my voice is not to be heard. I then realize that everything about our interaction says, I'm to know my place. But how can I, when I know you are sitting in it? And how you see me and treat me impacts how we interact. So in formulating solutions to advance the rights of women, ask, how do you interact or engage with someone like me, a black female lesbian who identifies as having a disability? Respectfully. There are many features that we share, but there are aspects of what makes me, me. When you look at me, what exactly is it that you see? Because I see you, but do you see me? When I speak, what exactly is it that you hear? Because I hear you, but do you hear me? We are here to work together. So why is it so hard? for you to respect me. I really want to speak to you, but will you listen to what I have to say? I cannot be just the face at the table. I cannot just hold a space. I have a voice that strains to be heard as I always speak from my truth. I have so much that I want to share, but I wonder would my narrative be understood. Women, we must stop accepting mediocrity and instead demand excellence. Excellence from ourselves and excellence for ourselves. We must understand the power of our individual voice and the power of our collective presence. We must understand our self-worth and not allow others to define who we are. Understand that sisterhood is inclusive of all women. It knows no color, it is global, and it has no boundaries. Women, this is our time. Woman is boss. You have heard of the Black Lives Matter movement, hashtag BLM, and the Me Too movement, hashtag Me Too. Well, this conference is the Break the Bias movement, hashtag Break the Bias. And that means no more targeting women for the color of our skin. No more excusing bias by calling it implicit. No more treating us as second-class citizens. No more daily doses of microaggressions. No more break the bias. No more assessing our word as connected to our genitalia. No more redefining our accomplishments as yours. No more feeling like we need to be taken care of when we can take care of each other. No more blaming us for your transgressions by attacking our credibility. No more break the bias. No more hiding who we are so you can feel comfortable in your blissful ignorance. No more loving who you want for us rather than who we want for ourselves. No more denying our sister's rights just because she was born our brother or our brother's rights because he was born our sister. No more seeking acceptance or agreement or tolerance of our existence. No more break the bias. No more laying down rules as if we're the help. No more telling us to know our place 
because you're in it. No more denying us the right to stand with you simply because we are unable to stand. No more. Break the bias. No more. Break the bias. The history of systemic discrimination institutionalized in many systems within which we operate to include the legal system ensures that our voices as women remain unheard. To regain our voice and achieve success requires that we understand the connectivity between all of our lives and the intersectionality of the problems we all face. I work in the law and a core legal principle in the law of civilized nations is that everyone must be treated equally without special privileges, discrimination or bias. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, equal justice is the glue of stability and judicial leadership is critical to human rights advancement. Leadership as a whole, I proffer, is critical to human rights advancement. We must aim to promote public confidence that our institutions, our firms, our businesses are fair with the equity, fairness, and protection of all individuals' rights as its goal. Diversity is a human rights issue which includes the maxim of acceptance and respect. It entails understanding that each individual is unique and recognizes our individual differences. Women, we have fought for the right to sit at the table and those of us who are privileged to be seated do not become complacent with having obtained a seat. Be vocal, demand not just to be heard, but demand to be understood. Otherwise, you are wasting a seat by being silent with inaction. Women, as you go through this conference, remember that our struggles are one and our strength is in our numbers. Even though we have differences, we are not truly different. To address bias and to make sustainable change, all it takes is just one, one person, one move, one vote, one woman. But imagine how powerful it is with all of us women. The law is a powerful tool that I use to effectuate change. Embracing and protecting vulnerable groups from exclusion you can do the same. We are all responsible to each other to create an inclusive environment and it must be inclusive at all times. We all have a responsibility to each other to be truly inclusive at all times in these efforts. I thank you for allowing me to share in this space and for giving my, a place where my voice can be heard. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Mm -hmm.